Dr. K. Annapurna, Madam, who is the head division of microbiology, IRA New Delhi. Madam has obtained her MS and PhD from uh, microbiology in the IARI New Delhi, and she has been a pioneer researcher in the field of molecular ecology of legume, lysobium symbiosis, azospirone, PGPR, and she has initiated work on soybean lysobium genetic diversity. She has developed a PCR based diagnostic marker for rapid detection of soybean brady lysobium. Her research into endophytes and soil metagenomics have identified potential bicontrol agents and genes coding for different antibiotics. She has guided 25 MSc and PhD students and has been PA for many externally funded projects from DBT, DSD, ICR funded research program. She has been also an investigator of Indo Australian, Indo UK, Indo US, and Indo German collaborative research project. And Madam is a recipient of IR Best Teacher Award for her excellence in the teaching. Hope you will be enjoying her uh, lecture. Women Leadership Award by Department of Biotechnology, Endowed Executive Award from Australia, INSA Award. Award of Excellence in PGPR Research, and she has edited many books on the microbial and eco-friendly solutions. Today, we have with us Madam Annapurna. She will be delivering a lecture on metagenomics and overview. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, since I was there, when you all uh, students introduced yourself, I do realize that you come from various parts of the country. and. Uh, uh, your research programs are also attuned to molecular uh, biology as well as some parts of diagn diagnostics, right? So um, today I will be going, uh, making you go through a little bit of uh, metagenomics. I won't go into very depth because I have seen in the schedule that uh, Dr. Subramaniam has been very meticulous in planning. Uh, some other advanced uh, components of uh, metagenomics. So I'll just cover uh, the metagenomics in an introductory fashion, right? And I would like uh, you to, though I'm a little short of time today, otherwise I would have uh, preferred to have an interactive session as my talk is going on. But in any case, if you are unable to understand uh, anything uh, in between, you can just stop me so that I like to see that the students are clear in their concepts. So this is just an overview and what exactly is metagenomics. And since you all have gone through or done a little bit on molecular biology, I'm sure you do understand what is a gene, what is a genome, what is an operon and those things. And those things are uh, talked about in context to your, um, what you call individual isolates individual isolates, whether it's a single strain of bacterium, whether it's a single strain of fungus, an yeast, or a protozoan, or something like that. But when we are talking about a community, that's where the concept of metagenome comes. Now, I'll ask you why this whole shift and focus on metagenomics in the last one decade or so. That's because the tools the molecular tools have become much more precise, much more advanced, and uh, the workers, the researchers have actually come out with very indigenous ways of studying the cells in a group. If you look at a colony of bacterium on a plate, right, it's not made up of one single cell. You're all aware of that because if it were to be, you would not be able to see the single cell at all. What's the size of a bacterium? Can anybody tell me? Any idea? It's all in microns, one to two microns. No, You won't be able to see through your naked eye. You need to have a, a microscope to visualize the cell and that too in a very, very low magnification, right? So the colony that you are seeing is a community, a millions of cells together. That's what the colony is. Now, when you are looking and when you are streaking on when you are studying that colony, it's not a single cell that you are studying. It's a community of cells that you are studying. Once the scientists understood this concept, then they realized that, okay, everything to do, whatever phenomena that we are studying, whether it's a symbiosis, whether it's a signaling, whether it's a production of a metabolite, everything is to do with a community of cells rather than a single cell. That's one part of metagenomics, when we are talking about cells, community of cells. The other part is what we are talking about, a community of microbes. 
it is not just bacillus sitting there or a pseudomonas sitting there or a serratia sitting there. It is a community of various genera. So, what we talk about is metagenomics in two different concepts. One, when we are taking the same genus but millions of cells together and the other is when you are taking talking about different microbes together in a community component. So, this is the basic uh, metagenomic concept. Now, if I go through uh, some of the preliminary things for you to understand, the first slide is to ask you what is a genome? Do you understand all what is a genome? Genome is an organism's complete set of DNA including all of its genes, coding or non-coding. All of these genes constitute a genome. So, each genome contains all the information needed to build and maintain that organism. And if I go next to the question, what is the genome structure? What is it made up of? When we are talking about genome, what does it constitute? In the molecular biology and genetics field, a genome is the genetic material of an organism consisting of DNA or RNA and RNA viruses. Uh, I am sure there are uh, one or two talks on viruses also in this or no? 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 Okay. So, but uh, since you come from molecular biology background, you do know that viruses are made up of RNA and that is the genetic material in uh, viruses. And the genome includes both the genes, that is the coding regions and also the non-coding DNA. So, a genome is a complete set of the DNA material of an organism. What is the average size of bacterial genome? Bacterial genomes are generally smaller and less variant in size among species when compared with genomes of animals and single cell eukaryotes. And bacterial genomes can range in size anywhere from 130 kilo bases to over 14 mega bases. So, it is a huge variation in bacterial genome and any eukaryotic uh, genome is much, much bigger than a prokaryotic genome. What is the difference between DNA and genome? So, these are some of the questions you should ask yourself when you are working in molecular biology because if these things are clear in you, then the understanding of the higher levels of genomics, recombinations, genetic engineering, all these things will become much, much clearer. So, what is the difference between DNA and genome? DNA is the molecule that is a hereditary material in all living cells and genes are made up of DNA and so is the genome itself. A gene consists of enough DNA to code for one protein and a genome is simply the sum of total of an organism's DNA. So, do you find the distinction between a DNA, a genome and a gene? I hope in this one slide it is much clearer to all you people. All right. So, coming to what is a metagenome? You have understood what is a genome, what is a DNA, what is a gene. Now, what is a metagenome? If you look at any environmental sample, whether it is uh, the sea waters or whether it is fresh water, soil, activated sludge, gut, this is some of the examples only I am giving. Most of you, if you read any review articles on metagenome, the very first sentence you will read is that less than 1 percent of your microbes have been cultivated, which means there are a huge mine of microbes, almost 98, 99 percent of microbes, which nobody has been able to study. So, when you are uh, culturing them, when you are preparing your media and when you are plating them out, you are unconsciously or deliberately, you are skewing up towards a partisan kind of an approach. Why? Because if I am preparing a King's B medium, and that is specific for pseudomonas, that, that to fluorescent pseudomonas. So, I am by, uh, by what you call choice, I am eliminating the rest of the bacterial uh, population which is there in that sample. I am only concentrating on fluorescent pseudomonas. Whereas, if I prepare a rose bengal medium or a PDA medium, I am also trying to look at the fungal. So, whatever medium that you are preparing, that is by choice you are actually uh, propagating some number of microbes only, the rest are not being able to be uh, cultivated in that, uh, in that medium. 
Now, what happens to the rest of the uh, organisms present there? They are all sitting there in that sample, whether it is soil, fresh water or sea water or whatever. They are all there, but you have not been able to cultivate that, right? This is where the techniques and tools of metagenome comes in. How can we bring the uncultivable portion of the microbial community to an, such an extent that we can actually study the various functions which these uncultivable organisms are exhibiting in that particular environment. And those tools and techniques which have been developed in due course of time have actually facilitated researchers in functional diversity approaches as well as structural diversity approaches. So here, this is just to give you an idea what is the amount of cultured organisms which people have come, uh, have done in these different samples. So if you look at soil, it is only about 0.3 percent. The rest, 99.7 percent still lies uncultivated. So this is the extent of diversity present. So this is a wealth of unexplored microbial genomes. Remember, genome is complete DNA material of that organism. And when we talk about metagenomic, it is a uh, total microbial community. When I say microbial, it is bacterial, fungal, acteromyces, everything. When I look into bacterial, then I would do only a 16S if I am looking a diversity, fungal 18S or ITS region. But when I am talking about metagenome of a microbial community, it includes all the components of microbes in there. So this is a huge unexplored uh, wealth and I have already said it is less than 1 percent which people have been able to cultivate and many of these uncultivated microbes exist in complex competitive communities, potentially source of novel biological active compounds. Now you tell me why in the past uh, decade or so, there is a huge research uh, surge in metagenomic study. Why should we have, why, why do we have to study metagenomics at all? Can anybody tell me? Why we are not satisfied with single isolates, single genomes? Why we are going towards microbial communities? We are? Okay, point one. Anybody else? And we can make some delta for another glory portion with the help of that microorganisms. What we are exploring from the next. Two, point two, some more. Repeatedly that word wealth. What else? Diversity is one thing. That is to know in this hall, you we have uh, females and males. But looking at you, at female uh, population and males population, there is huge diversity. No? Some are wearing specs like me, some do not wear specs, some are very fair in, some are not so. So different, different, that is diversity. But the diversity does not actually contribute to the functionality. Does it? Unless we know the function about that. The wealth is, this is a huge source of not only genes and alleles so that we can make constructs or vectors, but also they are the sources of different metabolites, antibiotics, uh, components, compounds which can be helpful in growth promotion, compounds which are helpful in medicine. So these are all different, different sources. There is whole wealth of just not the information, but also functional information. If you actually look at the recent ones, uh, you must have heard about multi-drug resistance in clinical trials. Are you all aware of that? And now India is one of the, uh, uh, one of the members of the uh, research center, which has been developed by, uh, what is that, Italy-based, um, uh, Italy based organization, I am forgetting that. But India is also a member and uh, in due course we will be coming up, uh, coming with a huge project because DBT has circulated that also. It is a EU based project. What I am trying to say is 
what as a child you were uh, able to cure your uh, some kind of an illness by only 10 uh, microgram of tetracycline now a person has to probably take 100 micrograms of tetracycline to cure that particular ailment why because we have in due course of time our system has become resistant to that and this is happening unknowingly unconsciously this is happening we are all becoming and the bacteria which is uh, co disease causing ones are becoming resistant to all these antibiotics. So that is a, a very huge worry in medical circles and this kind of metagenomic studies or explorations can actually help in coming out with some metabolites which can be targeted against those multidrug resistance bacteria. So that is the potentiality of metagenomic study. So, if you go back to uh, again what is metagenomics, academically I would say that it is culture independent genomic analysis of microbial communities and their physiology. This is what in one simple layman term I would say, not going into any hi-fi kind of terminology, I will say it is a culture independent genomic analysis of microbial communities and their physiology. And what exactly you understand, just concentrate on this, shotgun metagenomics. Now when, when I am talking about shotgun metagenomics, shotgun is what? It is an untargeted, like if I suppose I am using a 16S primer, I am going to only exclusively amplify the bacterial genetic material, is not it? Or if I do an ITS, uh, use an ITS primer. I will only exclusively concentrate on the fungal population. But when we do a shotgun one, it is an untargeted. It will take care of all the genes in the sample in all organisms present in a sample. That means indiscriminately without any bias, all the organisms present in that community or in that sample will be targeted. And meta is beyond, beyond a particular region. So that means it is not constricted with genus, with kingdom, with order, anything. Everything in that sample will be taken care of. And of course, genomics, you realize it is a genetic material. So if I look at shotgun metagenomics, this whole, in very simple layman terms, it is an untargeted study of the complete genes present in all the organisms in that particular sample in a uh, by using some molecular tools is that point clear till here is is it clear now okay <clears throat> so why do we do a shotgun metagenomics why do we like i asked you why do we study a metagenomics that's because we can actually explore beyond the isolates and try to get some new genes new alleles new promoter sequences or new metabolites, right? Why only a shotgun metagenomics? Just now I said that it will be excluding all, it is comprehensive. That means above a certain threshold where the threshold depends on coverage, depth of the microbes abundance in, this, in the sample. Recover whole genome sequences of all microbial community members, not just selected organisms or single marker gen genes. This is complete genome not a particular gene, complete genome. When I am talking about amplicon metagenomics, then it is a particular gene, whether it is a 16S, whether uh, it is a gene coding for an amylase enzyme or a gene coding for a sidrophore or something like that, that is gene specific amplicon targeting or gene specific amplicon metagenomics. But when I am talking about shotgun metagenomics, it includes the complete genome of the whole microbial community. Now the why this is important is it looks into the structure that is the taxonomic composition. It tells you who is there, who all are there. In this, in this uh, hall, if I each one of you is an integral part, each one of you have an identity. So, if I am looking at specific ones, I will tell how many are there and individually who, who all are there by name. 
and it the function, the metabolic potential, what can they do? Sitting here, each one of you together, what can you do? You can understand and you can come out with some new ideas, that is your function, that is a basic idea, is not it? So, when we are looking at metabolic, metagenomic metabolic ones, what we are looking at is, first of all, we are trying to find out who are the members of that community, two, how many are there, three, what is their function? So, the structure and function, these two are the two important components of metagenomics. So, when we uh, in, in another uh, this thing, so you take a sample, it can be any sample and when I say sample, the whole DNA of that sample and then you go ahead for the sequencing. The sequencing will tell you who is there, taxonomic classification and population analysis and what can they do? That is the functional analysis. If I uh, uh, pause here and take you back in one slide the history of metagenomics, where all and when all it started. This is in 1985, Pace and co-worker introduced the idea of cloning DNA directly from environmental samples. I know you all must have done, at least some of you must have done cloning in E. coli. I have a gene, uh, say suppose I have a gene coding for sidrophore production, so that gene I will amplify and that gene I will clone into E. coli and then see its expression. That every, many of you must have done. Now, when you are taking the DNA directly from the environmental sample, whether it is soil, water or uh, anywhere else, you can directly clone the DNA. And then in 1991, Schmitz and co-workers started cloning of DNA from mycoplankton in a phase vector subsequent 16S RNA sequence analysis. In 1991, Schmitz and co-workers started working with my, my, uh, picoplanktons. Then in 1995, Healy reported that first successful function driven metagenomics library was screened and termed as zoo libraries. Then the term metagenomics was actually coined by Handelsman, Joe Handelsman in 1998. If you read, uh, if you put metagenomics and Joe Handelsman in Google, you will come across a number of publications. She worked in Wisconsin University for a large number of years and then from there she has sifted, but she is still a very active worker and uh, she was the first one who coined this term metagenomics. Then in 2002, Mia and Forrest used shotgun sequencing to show that 200 liters of sea water contains over 5000 different viruses. So, this is just to take you back a little bit on the history and how this whole concept of metagenomics started. If you go for the timelines and the milestone, I do not know if this slide is clear to you people or not. It starts from 1676 when Leeuwenhoek reported his observations under a microscope, then 1818-88 when Robert Koch did the isolate, isolated the microorganisms, then in 1931 Vinogradsky and its, his column, uh, only those who have microbiology as a subject probably will know this, others may not be aware of this history, but in 1971 it was Fred Sanger's sequencing started and Carl Woos came out with the kingdom and uh, three domain kingdom uh, theory. And in 1980, it is again Carl, Carrie Mullis who started the PCR. This was, this particular year and this discovery was actually, what, what must I say, it was like, um, yeah, it, it, it was unimaginable and it was something which revolutionized the metagenomic uh, research. And of course, this was, uh, very well at uh, what you call pruned and then uh, it, the whole PCR machine became more and more and more advanced. <clears throat> and then of course, uh, in 1998, it was Handelsman, just now like I said, started work on metagenomics and over a period of years till 2015, it is shown here, but in 2019, if you take today's data also, there are number of publications which now have come on uh, metagenomics. This PCR, this Sanger sequence and these are what you call landmark uh, inventions, discoveries 
or search by the scientist, which gave a leap to the metagenomics and genomics research. The four components that one must uh, be very careful when we are working with metagenomics research is the isolation of the genetic material. You must realize that when, when we are doing from soil, we are only taking about 500 milligrams or uh, 50, uh, sometimes even 50 milligrams of soil to isolate the DNA. Now, the question is, will that DNA be representative of the whole community? Question number one. So, what do you do? I would do a replications because when you are using a mobile uh, that uh, kit, not kit actually, mobile kit as well as the uh, bio bead beater, I would like to put at least 5 replicates. So, I will take 500 mg of the same soil 5 times and do it and pool the DNA. So, doing it just single thing, you may lose out on some and you may not be able to be completely representing the sample microbial population of that sample. The first is isolation of genetic material. Second is manipulation of the genetic material. Remember, we uh, because we come from uh, agriculture background, so my work is mostly on soil metagenomics. So when I am doing soil uh, DNA isolations, there are lot large number of hurdles. The basic one is humic acid. Humic acid in soil will be degrading your DNA like anything. So, you must, the protocol that you are using for isolating metagenome from the soil, you must ensure that there is at least one step which removes the humic acid also. But otherwise, you cannot store the DNA for long duration. Even if you keep it at minus 80, the DNA will not be uh, the same. After some time, it will get degraded. So, you will not be able to use the DNA. So, the protocol that we use for soil DNA extractions are having steps where we remove the humic acids, we remove some of the phenolic compounds so that the DNA can stay longer and you can use it for your further research work. Then the library construction. In the whole process, there is always a library construction because whatever genome that you have isolated, whatever DNA that you have isolated, it has to be constructed, it has to be put into a library and that library will constitute the complete genome of that particular sample. Now, that library can be in different ways in plasmids or other things, but I will come to that little later. And then after the library construction, the analysis of genetic material in the genomic library, better genomic library. These are the steps. The first is your DNA material. You must ensure the purity of that DNA material. The second, you should manipulate it in such a way that it has a larger keeping quality because it is not necessary that you are isolating DNA today and immediately you will start processing it. You may have to keep it in deep freezers for a while. So, you should ensure that the DNA does not get degraded during that storing period and then you have to construct a library. Again, like I said, construction of a library should also be representative. You should ensure again that whatever library you are constructing, it should be representing the complete genome of that sample. And then of course, how do you analyze that library for further work? Now this library construction, I will skip this. This library construction okay, can be in different ways. Uh, this is like DNA knowledge application, the, the, these things I will again skip. This is the steps which are involved. I only told you till here, but actually after DNA extraction, either you go for, you have to go for library uh, construction and then the DNA sequencing, then the assembly, then the annotation and other analysis. There is, I know again, there are people who are going to take up these uh, components and will speak to you. I will restrict myself to here and then talk to you about uh, further this thing. I will give you one or two examples of uh, the metagenomes as applied in gut or humans. There is, there was a huge human uh, project also which was uh, globally it was uh, taken up and here you can see that 
the ecological and evolutionary forces shaping microbial diversity in the human intestine. The human gut is populated with as many as 100 trillion cells whose collective genome, the microbiome, is a reflection of evolutionary selection pressures acting at the level of host and at the level of microbial cell. I do not know whether you are able to see this slide very clearly or not. This is uh, just to tell you, this is a comparison of microbial diversity in the human colon, mouse and ocean and soil. This red portion is all human, this la last one, second comes your mouse, then the fish, then the ocean. The, this circle gives you an idea how much of similarity and dissimilarity is there in the microbial population in various samples. And if you look at this, again I am sure this is not very clear to the backbenchers, but this also gives a validation, a variation in bacterial diversity within the colonic microbiota of three healthy humans. Among the human population also you find this kind of a diversity. In, in short, what I was trying to uh, impress upon you is your microbial community is responsible for your health as far as when we are talking about humans. When I talk about soil, what I am looking at there is soil health is also equally important for your crop productivity. So, if I am talking about soil health and soil microbial community, I would be looking at the total microbial community in the soil and I would also want to see what is the function of that. Because merely studying the structure <coughs> or the diversity of the microbial population in any sample is only of academic interest. What they are doing and what they are contributing is the one which is of paramount interest, is not it? Just to know what is the diversity is not enough, academically fine, but unless you know what that diversity is contributing to you, any particular function, it has of no meaning. So, when that came later, earlier uh, it was all, uh, all about, uh, yeah, earlier it was all about structure analysis when people did not have the means of look, uh, the means of studying the functionality. Now we have here uh, what we are looking at is isolate the genome single DNA. This is single, single, single isolates. But when we take the environmental genome, you have different uh, microbes, and from all these you are isolating the DNA and then categorizing them. Each one of them, this these different color codes are actually telling you the different functions. In, in nature, how can you actually look into this? We can, if I am looking at an enzyme production, suppose I want to study the amylase production of the sample, what will I do? I will extract the whole genome, make library of that and then plate it out in medium which goes, which has the starch as one of the components. Whichever clone is able to produce that amylase enzyme will show me a zone. So, that means all those clones which are showing zones in the uh, starch based medium plate are the ones which is having the gene which is coding for that enzyme. Now, that gene can be a uh, very normal ones or that gene sequence can be of different nature. So, by doing that kind of a screening, I am not only looking at one particular function of that uh, community, but I, I am also able to extract the gene, I mean uh, isolate the gene from each clone, get it sequenced and then see what is the heterogeneity of that particular gene in that community. How similar the gene sequence is, nucleotide sequence of the gene is or how dissimilar it is. And if I come across uh, an entirely new sequence, but having the same function, 
then I have come across a novel gene sequence which codes for that particular enzyme. So, it is a tedious a little tedious process, but you can do the functionality uh, of that particular uh, community by screening out in a different. For every function your approach and your experimentation can be different. This is the simplest example that I have given that if you want to look for amylase producing community from a particular sample you can plate it you can plate out that library on a medium having starch as your component is not it. So, this is the simplest example I have given. Now, one thing you again you must remember is when we are talking about these uh, beta genomics like I said structure, structure is how many organisms are there in that community. That structure you can look by the species richness and the evenness. If I am talking about bacterial then I will concentrate on 16S RRT gene analysis. Again, if I am looking at 16S RRN genesis, it can be so many different types of bacteria, is not it? Now, by doing there are special softwares and you can analyze, you must have heard about Shannon diversity, alpha diversity, beta diversity, Shannon. So, there are so many, yeah, cow diversity or chow diversity, chow analysis. They are all different ways of measuring and estimating the abundance of a particular group and also the uh, richness of a particular group. There, these are slightly different components in the same uh, community. That means, if I am talking about abundance, what do you understand? If there are suppose 100 different bacteria, of that 100 different bacteria, if 50 bacteria are of the same genus like bacillus. So, that means bacillus is dominant in that particular community. The rest 50 can be distributed 10, 5, 2, 3, 4, something, 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 is not it? So, that is your abundance, but that abundance always uh, take it with a question mark. That abundance need not uh, translate into any function also. Maybe there are bacteria which are very low in abundance but they may be the major contributors for a particular function. And in soil when we are talking about, we have say different uh, nutrient cycles, nitrogen geocycles, phosphorus geocycles and all. And I am talking about say denitrification phenomena in soil, then I will be looking only for denitrifiers. And the denitrifiers may not be in high abundance, they may be in very low abundance, but their function is of paramount importance under anaerobic soil conditions in paddy fields, is not it? So, it depends on what is it that you are looking for. This is, I just put it in such a way that if you look at the genome co coverage, it is proportional to the abundance in the library. The abundant types will always have a larger genome coverage obviously, because there are so many cells of the same uh, genus. And this as the genome coverage, uh, as the abundance goes down, the genome coverage also goes down. So, when uh, like I said, how do you plan your experimentation in such a way that the low abundance ones you want to uh, work with? Then you need to enrich the your soil in such a way that the low presence of a particular genus or some microbe is actually improved upon. Have you, uh, I do not know if you are from microbiology background, but there is something called an enrichment technique for cultivation. So, what we do is if we are particularly interested in say, I am interested in azospillum, I will put malate in that soil and keep on uh, for 10, 15 days I leave it so that maximum population of azospillum comes up and then I will do the extraction. So, I have, I am in, su in such a way, I am trying to enrich a particular genus of my interest and then do the metagenomics out of that. So, these are, diff it is up to you how you design your experiment to work with a whole genome community or a whole microbial community. 
So, I would not go into that, but library size is something again I will uh, in, in practicals I am sure you will be taking up, but I will just uh, go through quickly on libraries. When you prepare a library, these are classified into two groups with respect to average insert size and the choice of the vector system. It is very similar when you do the cloning for individual genes from a, uh, cultivated microbes. You, want, you do not want to clone a small gene of say only about uh, say 500 or 600 base pairs in a cosmid. Do you need to? You do not have to. You can use a plasmid. So, the choice of the vector depends on the size of your insert. When in most of our uh, conventional cloning procedures, we use a plasmid, the normal plasmids and then we clone it into E. coli DH5 alpha or JM109. These are the common E. coli recombinant deficient uh, strains which have been constructed and developed. But when we are talking about metagenomic libraries, because we want a uh, insert which is a little bigger, because when we are restricting the whole genome by using rare cutters, we will use larger fragments of the whole genome for construction of the library. Why? Because we do not want any gene to be cut in between and if we use that is one point. Second is if you use a larger fragment, then it will be less number of fragments that you will be screening. Otherwise, the library will be in millions and millions and it will be very difficult to screen the millions of clones that you would have generated. So, when you have a larger fragment, the gene is intact and the number of clones that you need to screen will be less. The moment you get any positive clone, that you can still extract and then again restrict it, <coughs> make a library and then again do the screening. So, the choice of the vector and the insert size, these are the two important parameters we uh, look for when we prepare the libraries of the metagenome. So, if it is a small insert, you use the plasmid vectors and if it is a large insert, you will use cosmids or phosmids or even back vectors. <coughs> I, I am hoping that you know cosmids and phosmids and back or yak, these, these are different vectors. And the choice of vector system depends on the quality of isolated DNA and the average insert site. Now, what is the advantages and disadvantages of the library preparation? The Small insert libraries which you prepare in plasmids, these are the advantages. Technically, it is very simple and you have a high copy number which allows the detection of weakly expressed foreign genes and the expression of foreign genes from vector promoters is also feasible and cloning of shear DNA or soil DNA contaminated with matrix substance is possible. These are some of the advantages, but then they also come, every coin has a head and tail. So, they also come with some kind of disadvantages. Small insert size, then large number of clones must be screened to obtain positives and not suitable for cloning of activities and pathways that are encoded by large gene clusters. Is this point clear? This is a very important <coughs> point. Many times the enzyme activities of what you are interested in or even for example, the polyketide uh, synthesis, the coding of that or the polyketide synthase is coded by a cluster of about 7 to 8 genes. So, it is not a single gene enzyme, it is not one gene, one enzyme. It is 7 to 8 genes together will make that one enzyme. So, when that is the kind of material that you are interested to work with, then you should not use go for the plasmid vectors at all, because 7, 8 genes together has to be there for the enzyme production to take place. And obviously, you cannot use plasmid for doing that kind of a cloning. So, you have to then go for plasmids or one of these vectors. The advantage is you have large insert size small numbers of clones can be screened to obtain positive, this I have just now said. 
and suitable for cloning of enzyme activities and pathways that are encoded by gene clusters and suitable for partial genomic characterization of uncultured soil microorganisms. That is there. Now, the disadvantages of this is you have low copy number which might prevent detection of weakly expressed foreign genes. Do you understand what is a copy number? What is a copy number? <coughs> number of copies, yeah. Everybody is it clear for you people? Copy number? The more copies like uh, have you all done a 16S PCR or an 18S or an ITS PCR? Have you ever done? How many copies of 16 as there are there in a cell? Any idea? No. Generally, it is one single copy. In some of the bacteria I have come across, it is a two copy numbers also. Genes which are coding for a product, coding for a protein, 16 as does not code for anything, please remember that nor 18s, they do not code for any protein or anything like that. They are uh, useful for taxonomy, diagnostics, not for any other things. But a gene which codes for a protein that can be in multiple alleles, that can be present in number of copies. So, the higher the number of those alleles, the more is the production by a single cell. If the plasmids, like here we are talking about plasmids and the copy numbers, <coughs> like he said, if the plasmid copy numbers are more, the expression of that gene will be more, obviously, because every uh, unit of the plasmid will be having that particular insert. But if the uh, copy number is low, that means when the multiplication is taking place in the bacterial cell, every cell of the bacterium will not be hosting uh, that plasmid. So, obviously, if there is 100 bacterial cell, maybe only 50 of them is having the plasmid, others are not having the plasmid. So, what happens is the expression of that particular gene in a low copy number of the plasmid will be low and detection will also become a problem. So, this is the major disadvantage of uh, any large uh, vector which you are using because it is heavy and the cell has to expend more amount of energy to replicate that unit that is the reason. So, you have if it is a low copy number it will prevent detection of weakly expressed foreign genes and the limited expression of foreign genes by vector promoters and requires high molecular soil DNA of high purity for library construction. These are some of the disadvantages of uh, large insert vector. I will have another two slides just to re, re, uh, reassert uh, once again. Construction and analysis of metagenomic libraries which are function driven is something like this. I do not know if this is clear or not, but I will uh, just read it out. Identification of clones expressing a desired trait. Like I told you, if I am interested in amylase production, I will look for the clone which is showing a zone of clearing in a plate which has starch as its carbon source, right. <coughs> and then sequence and biochemical analysis of those clones. All those positive clones, I will take it out, release the insert and get the sequencing done to know what is the nucleotide uh, sequence and number of nucle nucleotides which are there in that particular insert and how different or similar it is to the rest of the clones. That will give me the nucleotide diversity of that particular gene in that microbial community. How heterogeneous that is or how homogeneous that is. So, that gives me the, so here comes the diversity component and the function component is the analysis of that enzyme. And all genes required for the function in one clone and expression in that host cells. Whatever number of genes are necessary for expression of that gene, they should be in one clone, then only it will be expressed, otherwise it will not be expressed. That is one important factor. And then sequence driven analysis, that was functional driven analysis. I am looking at the function of that clone. 
Here I am looking at the sequence driv driven analysis. Here what do I do? Use conserved DNA sequences to design the primers or the hybridization probes and then the do either a PCR using the primers to screen the metagenomic libraries for clones that contain sequence of interest. Is this point clear? I am making a probe of that sequence of the insert using that insert or I am designing a primer for that particular uh, insert. The sequence of the insert is known to me, I have got the insert sequence. So, I can design a primer and by using a PCR technique, I will PCR all the clones and then see which one of them is going to amplify that particular sequence. So, this is another approach which is structure driven and then do the sequencing. So, you will again know whether the sequences are uh, similar <coughs> and if similar to what extent and if dissimilar to what extent. These two approaches are the ways of doing analyzing your metagenomic libraries. Either you can do a functional analysis, it is like a bottom up one or you can do a structural analysis. Design a primer for the insert sequence or make the insert as a probe and then do a hybridization or by designing the primer you can do a PCR and do the PCR for all the number of clones that you have in your hand and see how many of those clones are having that particular in insert and then see th get the insert sequenced to know what is the structural similarity or dissimilarity of that particular gene. Is this clear? Yes. No, you make a library <coughs> and that library you have plated out. So, when you have say 10 plates or 50 plates and every plate is having about 10 or uh, I mean 50 or 20 or 100 clones coming up. Every clone, but if you are, uh, if you have a probe, if you that insert, if you have developed a probe, you can use any uh, non uh, iso uh, labeled probes or labeled probes. You can do a colony hybridization. So, you can screen about 1000 colonies and see which of those colonies are giving you that signal that that is the positive clone which has that particular insert or else by uh, looking at the sequence of that uh, insert, you can design primers to the 5 prime and 3 prime end and that primer you can use for doing a PCR. <coughs> you can do a PCR like a colony PCR or individually every colony can be grown, DNA extracted and then do a PCR of that. So, we, so out of 1000 colonies and you have done PCR for all those 1000, how many of those 1000 have given the amplicon of your interest? So, maybe out of 1000, uh, 550 have given you the amplicons, all those 550 are positives for this insert. So, either way you can do it, you, you, but then the point is this is what it is. If you are looking only at the structure, if you are looking only at the nucleotide sequence to know how dissimilar or similar they are, you can uh, use this approach. But out of those 550 clones, how many are functional? You have to go back again to that screening. So, in a way instead of putting all the 10,000 clones, you have narrowed it down to 5, 500, 550 or maybe 300 and those 300 you can again do a screening for functionality and see which one of them are positives for that thing. It depends what is your objective. Do you want to look only at the nucleotide sequence ATGC and know how much is the variation, diversity or homogeneity in that population? Or are you looking at the uh, retrieving one of or two clones which will be producing that particular enzyme and you want to upscale it or do something else with that. Suppose that clone is an antibiotic producer and it is a novel antibiotic, you can actually commercialize it and go for industrial scaling up. 
So, it depends on your aim and your approach and that approach will design the experimental layout for you. What kind of experimentation you have to do for coming to that objective or for fulfilling that objective. Is that clear? Okay. I think uh, should I, I think I will have to stop here. Uh, I do not know if uh, these are all for the students only I just put it like that. But if you have uh, any other questions I will get back and interact with you later on. Okay. So, thank you very much.